I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke, the 15th chapter. And for the most part, that's where, where we're going to be this afternoon. And we're going to be dealing with something that you already probably know. But in part, I'm doing it for uh, putting it onto our YouTube channel, but also for us to consider and to begin to grow and develop and look at things from a totally different perspective sometimes. It always does us good to do that, to look at things differently, to examine it from the inside out, the outside in, and every which way. So back in Luke, the 15th chapter, you have the story of the prodigal son. And again, we're familiar with it. I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that you probably haven't already heard. But maybe I will kind of just sneak up on you. So look at the background of it. We know it runs from verse 11 down through 32. And we know that while the young man, and we assume he's young, he's the younger brother, was in his father's house, he enjoyed it so much. He enjoyed the love of the father. And speaking as one who might be referred to as the prodigal, because my life story is one that took me far, far away from where I was raised and ultimately brought me back, in a sense, to where I should have been in the first place. But in a father's house, there is love. And even though my father and I were at loggerheads, more often than not, and I was told at one point, we bought a new home. There's two bedrooms. One of them ain't yours. I mean, you kind of get the hint. But I do know that deep down, my father loved me. I know my mother loved me in spite of myself. So when he left his, his house, he was leaving that behind. But while there, he enjoyed that love. Our society would be far better off if more and more children had fathers, both parents, in the home. It's been shown uh, psychologically, societally, every which way you can dissect it. That having parents in the home makes it better for the child. He had a sense of well-being, a sense of belonging, and that's what a family does bring. Austin was talking earlier today. And as we've gone through the day, there have been mentioned, whether in class or on comments of the men leading, about us being kind of like a family and that people feel a sense of belonging. We need to convey that, that people belong. You're welcomed here. You're appreciated. And we embrace that. Well, that, that's what this young man had. He had a sense of belonging. Whether he wanted it or not, he had wise counsel. He had instruction while at home. Most of us don't like instruction. We don't like to be told when we're doing something wrong. We don't want to receive the instruction. And when it comes, we bristle. But he had that. And all of us needed. He had security. Security is important. It's the one thing that when you ask women what they want in a relationship, first thing that comes out of their mouth is security. I want to feel safe. I want to feel secure. I want to feel protected. When a young man goes and asks the father of the young woman he wants to marry. The father almost instinctively says, I want you to take care of her. Now at lunch, we were talking about taking care of somebody in a dualistic way. Take care of her or take care of her. However you want to phrase it. But the way we want it implied is take care of her. Provide her safety and security. Well, in a home, that's what you find. You find safety. You find security. 
after the earthquake in 94. We were cleaning up everything. Linda and I sat down at the close of the day and I looked at her and I said, you know what? I wanna go home. And she goes, yeah, so do I. Then it dawned on us, we're home. And this is where we are and our sons need us because earlier that day, Adam was sitting in the car with me. We watched house after house explode. And he reached over and he does not do this. He hugged me and said, dad, are we going to be okay? Are we going to be okay? He was about 12 ish then. And I reassured him it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Security is something we all want. We talk about investments to be secure for our old age. We know that. So that's what this young man had in his father's house was security. He was given every opportunity to succeed. Apparently the father had uh, means and wherewithal and he had a sense of purpose. But all of this, the things that we long for, all of this was surrendered when he made his decision to part. It was all left behind. So notice Luke, that 15th chapter, and watch as it begins to unfold. So look at verse, uh, look at verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the young son gathered everything together, went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. So, I want you to give me. He's demanding. We were talking in the men's class yesterday about choices, and we talked about poor choices, and we talked about taking time to really consider your choices before you make them. And more often than not, we don't. We just jump into things. This young man didn't take much time. This is a major decision. But what you see as we read on is he made one poor choice after another, after another. He was taken away physically. He was taken away emotionally. He was taken away mentally of all of his own accord. He went to a far country and he took everything he had. Now, from a psychological standpoint, when you take everything, that's indicative. You don't plan on going back. But if you leave something, that gives you an excuse to go back. Oh, I left. I left something behind. I need to get it. He took everything. In his mind, this break was full, was complete. And so he's demanding, give me. He thinks the father owes him all that the father had worked for. He owed it to him. But the father graciously divided it up. But the hubris on the part of the young man to demand, give me, give me. Well, even before he demanded his share, he had already made the decision to depart. Before he said to his father, give me. 
It was already in his mind. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Look at the lack of respect on the young man's face. And I realize it's all in word form, but he's demanding. There's no respect for his father. Give me. And then to turn his back on everything his father had tried to do for him. It's unconscionable. His departure was final, at least in his mind. And he went to a far country. And it's clearly stipulated by Christ, far country. He went far away. I mean, when I was little, I ran away a lot. And I'd go down to the corner and my mom would dispatch one of my sisters, go until Bruce's lunchtime, go until Bruce's time to come home for bed. And I would sit down on the corner with my little suitcase and I was bound and determined to go to a far country. I didn't know how I was going to go or what I was going to do, but I ran away. I ran away when I was 16 and I ran away to Newport, California. There was a festival going on and I went down there, but I really didn't run away. I ran to my older sister's house, stayed with her and her husband. My father went looking for me by calling around. It only took him two phone calls. And he informed her, send him back when he's done. So I stayed there a couple of days, but knew that I had the availability to go back home. Disappeared again for a while. When a friend of mine got married in Tijuana, he wanted me to go and be his best man. So his brother and I went with he and his fiance got to the border and they wouldn't let my friend and I across. And we go, why? And they go, you look too un unbecomingly. You can't go in. You two can come in and get married. You two stay over here. So we had to wait. This young man, in his mind, he was permanent. Those times that I ran away, the weird thing about it, I never thought it was going to be permanent. I never, I never, because I left things behind. I could always find an excuse to go back. Even when I was told two bedrooms, one's not yours. Once a week, I'd go back to the house and my mom would wash my clothes. I'd get a decent meal. But this young man, I'm not coming back. His choices. Well, let's read and see what happened. Uh, I gathered everything. And in the latter part of 13, into a distant country, he squandered his estate with loose living. I don't know how much, but apparently it was considerable. He went into a life of debauchery. He went to the bottom of the barrel. We're going to see that in a moment. There was no end to what he would do and how far he would go. Every year, Labor Day weekend, in the desert outside of Reno, is what's called Burning Man. And uh, from what I understand, everything goes. Whatever you want to do is fine, as long as it stays within the confines of Burning Man. I thought it was interesting this year when the rains came and the floods rose up and they were told, you can't get out of here. And they threw a wild-eyed fit because they were constrained right there. You want to be free? Here, you got your freedom. You can't come and go as you want. You're free. But you're free in this area. Interesting. 
but his life of debauchery led him deep and deeper into a position where he was destitute. Look at the next verse. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. When he had lost it all, I don't think, and I think I would remember this, if I was ever to that point where I needed to go on the street and beg for money. I don't think that ever happened, at least with me. I'm down and out, sure, but I always knew where to go to get a meal, to get a bed, and so forth. This man's life of debauchery brought him to the lowest of lows in degradation. He lost everything. Got a call one morning in Las Vegas. And uh, it's from one of the casinos. And they said, there's a woman here that needs to talk to you. Her husband has just died. He died in the buffet line. And she claims she's a member of the Church of Christ. So I went down there. I found the woman. And we began talking. And yes, her husband had had a massive coronary and died in the breakfast buffet line. And she told me their story. They were from Maine. They owned a business. Business was running on hard times. So they thought they'd go to the bank of Las Vegas, her terms, not mine. And they took everything that they had, brought it with them to Las Vegas to gamble in order to get money to keep their business afloat, keep from going bankrupt. They lost all their money, everything. The hotel was going to evict her. Her time was up. She had the airplane tickets to fly home, but she needed another special ticket of some sort to transport her dead husband back. And that would be two or three days hence. She had no money. Her credit cards were maxed out. And she was there weeping. Somehow or another, we were able to get it all resolved. Uh, I kind of worked a little bit of magic when I said, well, you really don't want the Las Vegas Register to know about this man dying in the buffet line. And wouldn't you be better served by putting her up for a couple of days, no charge, and showing compassion than rather having the story leak out that you threw a widow out on the street? They thought about it and said, oh, sure. Comp, we'll comp her. I'll tell you what, we'll comp her for more than two days. We'll comp her for a week. She can stay, she can partake of the buffet and whatever she needs. I called the congregation where they were members and told them, you know, that she needed prayers and let them know the situation. And they were aghast because those people were stalwarts in the congregation. Nobody would have ever thought what would happen to them happen. So you probably look at this young man and go, who would have thought it? Because it can happen to any one of us for any number of reasons if we're not mindful. And we're talking now spiritually. Look at what we have spiritually in God's household. We have security. Um, we have security. We have the love of the father. We have the love of the brother. We have wise counsel and instruction. We have unlimited opportunity to go forward. We have a sense of purpose. We have all of that. 
and we have something better promised, i.e. a sense of purpose. But this young man, he threw all away. For what? He got so destitute. He was so degraded that he went and started working and he worked handling pigs. Pigs for a Jew, that is terrible. Have you ever smelt a pig farm? They're nasty. I used to be able to play golf for $5 for 18 holes, including a cart. And one of the places that allowed that, this was in Las Vegas, uh, was close to a pig farm. And if the wind hit just right, whoa, you'd be saying, boy, howdy, does that stink? And I should pay you to let me, or you should pay me to play. That man was working with pigs. And he was looking at what they were eating and desire to even have that. Let's read on. Go into 15, uh, back into 15. And so, attached himself to one of the citizens uh, of that country in verse 15. He sent him into the field to feed swine. He was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, verse 17, he was only came to his senses after he was broke, broken and broken again. It took him three times at least before he came to his senses. You know, a lot of times it takes people that many times to come to their senses, whether it be physically or spiritually. And a lot of the times those two are joined together. So he comes to his senses. So had to be a harsh awakening. Had to be. Had to be. That woman that morning, it was harsh. Is my husband going to be saved? We lost everything. We came here. We gambled it away. Is my husband going to be saved? I can't answer that. It's up to God. God's judgment. God's mercy. God knows the thoughts and intents. I couldn't answer that. But it was a harsh awakening. She came to her senses. What have we done? Now, if her husband hadn't died, would she have still come to that conclusion? I don't know. I don't know. But what he does, let's read on a little bit further. Pay attention to what he says. Verse 17. How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread but I am dying here with hunger. My dad's hired men are in better shape than I am. Verse 18, I will, I will. When you hear that, that's indicative of firm resolution. I will, I will. When somebody says that, that means they've changed their mind change their direction when you do counseling and you hear somebody finally listen to what you're saying. They look at you and said, you know what? Here's what I need to do. I will do X, Y, or Z. I will. By those words, it is a covenant that they have made with themselves. I affirm it with myself. I don't affirm it with anyone else but I affirm it with myself. So here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do. Verse 19. In verse 19, true humility is on display. Because there. Watch what he says. 
I no longer. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your slaves. He said, here's what I got to do. I've got to go back and this is what I got to say. He's saying this to himself before he goes back. But this is what I got to do. I know what I need to do. I know the right thing to do it. And I'm willing to do it. Verse 20. I'm willing to face the consequences. I am fully willing to face whatever consequences await me. That is remarkable. I'm not going to go back as, as a son. I don't deserve that. Because of the way I treated my father, the way I've treated me, the disrespect of everything. But I've got to go back and beg for forgiveness. I've got to humble myself. And maybe, just maybe, my father will allow me to come back as a hired hand. It's remarkable. This young man came to these decisions before he went back. He came to these decisions on his own. Look at me. Look at where I am. I'm eating garbage. I'm not even eating that. It's deplorable what I've done. I need to go back. I need to humble myself and I'll face whatever consequences come because I know there are consequences. I know. We sometimes try to sneak around the consequences, but there are consequences that have to be paid to everything that we do. Now notice what he does in verse 21. In 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's humility. That is humility. And that is what repentance is all about. Now, look at what he's doing. He's disavowing everything. And by disavowing, I don't mean he's saying, no, no, that never happened. But he's saying, I don't want to be associated with that anymore. I've completely turned away from it. And I'm willing to accept whatever fate you may decide to meet, or, to meet out to me. I'm willing. So please hear my repentance, hear my state. I've been, I've been deplorable, detestable. And I come before you now. See, we really don't, we really don't spend a lot of time with respect to repentance. We think repentance is simply verbal. Somebody coming forward and asking for the prayers of the congregation on their behalf. Uh, that's part of it. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So what repentance is, is to be truly sorry for. Not sorry you got caught but to be truly sorry for your actions. To have a mind change. To truly have your mind altered. So I'm really sorry for what I've done. And I've changed my mind. And I've turned away. And now what I've got to do is I've got to act totally differently. I've turned away from it. I'm a different person. 
That's no longer part of me. You've got to change. You've got to have different behaviors. You have to have a different manner and approach to life. You can't be simply verbal. Change behavior is the clearest example of repentance. I've changed my behavior. And that's what we kind of, we keep coming back to. This young man was willing to do it. When he did, verse 22, you see there was restoration on the part of the father. I'm not bringing you back as a slave. You're coming back as a son, an heir, an heir. You're coming back as my son. The ring was put on his finger. This morning, Ricardo came in and sat behind Linda and I. And he smacked me so I'd know he was there as if. Anyways, he goes, I forgot my ring. I didn't say anything to him. He goes, I forgot my wedding ring. So I took my ring off and handed it to him. And he went to put it on. I go, no, 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 give it back. Rings are important. So later on, he was talking to me in the foyer. And he said, you know what I got to do is I got to get a, a ring tattooed on. So I never forget it. And I said, yeah, you don't want too many jewels on your hands. And he looked at me, he goes, yeah, you're right. Why? I said, you're a magician. You don't want to get him caught up. You don't want that. Because when you're doing your prestidigitation, you don't want any snags, any grabs. But a ring is important. When the father put the ring back on him, it showed, again, relationship. This morning we talked about my hands are tied. We talked about that phrase, there's another phrase we use. The third time's the charm. Under Roman law, you had three steps in order to be adopted. After the third one, you got the charm, i.e. the necklace or the ring. The father is saying you're back in the family. You're back in the family. And when that happened, there was joy and rejoicing. One of the things we're trying to do <clears throat> to me with the cards that you all have been sending out is trying to make a connection with individuals who at one time maybe had been members here or visited here. And we want them to know we still care for them. And we're gonna dig even deeper and find even more addresses and reach out to those lost in sin. Because we long for them to come back. They may have gone a far way. They may have wandered so far beyond that they probably think there's nothing that I could do that would allow God to forgive me. You're limiting God. You're limiting God. Repentance truly and fully. Because what's also involved in repentance is trying to make it as right as possible. If I stole something, I'm going to try and return it. I'll work to make it right. Whatever it takes, I'll try and do it. I'll try. So those that have wandered away and I know there are some on YouTube who have mentioned to me that they're watching. And I know you're watching. And I know that you probably would in your honest heart say you've wandered away. Don't think that you've gone too far. Don't think that you can't come back. Because all it demands is you to be, have a firm resolution, a sense of humility, a willingness to repent. 
But all that can only happen when you come to that awakening. I'm lost and I need to come home. Home is right here. Home is with the household of God. Ye who are weary, come home. The lesson is yours this afternoon. But if you do need spiritual assistance, you'll see a contact number at the end of this. Reach out. I'll be glad to talk to you. Send me an email. Text message. If you want to study further, if you haven't put on Christ in the waters of baptism, we can arrange for to do it online or depending on where you are. We could even arrange to have somebody do it in person with you where you live. It can be arranged. Our only desire is for your soul's salvation. If there's any way we can be of assistance, please reach out. Upon that cross.